Well, welcome everybody to our peer-to-peer -peer webinar hosted by Iowa State Extension's Local Food Program. Thanks to everyone for joining us today and for fill, filling out that um, registration that really helped inform some of the content that we'll be discussing. Um, really appreciate all of that work. I'm Chelsea Christ. Um, I'm a farm to school coordinator with Iowa State Extension's Local Food Program. And I am really thrilled to introduce our honored guest and friend from North Carolina, Tess Springs, who's gonna lead our webinar today. Uh, Tess works for NC State Extension, and she is the Youth and Community-Based Food Systems Coordinator with the Center for Environmental Farming Systems. And this webinar today um, will be a presentation and discussion around challenges in rooting food systems work in racial equity and what tools and resources are out there to support all of us in this process. Um, Tess will be sharing your screen. If you have any issues seeing anything, uh, please use the chat box to let us know that. Um, if you have questions throughout the presentation um, and you don't have the ability to use a microphone, uh, please use that chat button at the bottom and we'll make sure that your voice is heard here. So with that, I'll turn it over to Ms. Tess, and thanks again for being here. Thanks, Chelsea. Um, I'm really excited. Um, can you hear me okay? Yep. I think we can hear okay. you. Okay. Um, uh, I'm Tess Thraves. I am in North Carolina. Um, I work for the Center for Environmental Farming Systems, which is um, part of the two land grant universities in North Carolina. So I'm technically cooperative extension. Um, and because we do only sustainable ag um, and, um, and have a research station, a 2000 acre research station that our local food programming grew out of, um, we're about 25 years old. Um, um, we're a, a little bit of a odd entity. So, um, and in the, um, kind of uh, real life stuff for the day um, and in my wife's office um, so that the internet would be stable as opposed to my office and it's not. So I'm on the phone, if you can't hear, holler, raise your hand, um, so forth. I'm really looking forward to chatting today as well as providing some information. Um, it, the original plan was for a really small group and then it sounded like it's gonna be a really big group and now I think it's a fairly small group so I'm hoping we can actually chat. So um, really please um, write into the chat box um, or raise your hand um, or just holler um, if you can do that. Um, if you have a question while I'm going, um, this is kind of um, what I'm planning. So I'll, I'll talk to you a little bit about where I'm coming from specifically around the racial equity work. Um, and then go through um, kind of some basic tenets of how we approach this stuff. Um, and mostly, I'm really using the um, responses to the survey, which if we can get to y'all, might be really interested. It's pages, like 30 pages of information, um, but um, it was fascinating. Um, I really, really appreciate all the thought and care that folks put into that. and. Um, and again, this is um, of my heart. Um, and so I really appreciate folks' interest in the topic um, and dedication to the work coming from this place. Um, so um, yeah, I'm just gonna kind of plug ahead. Um, I am um, in, in SEFS, our organization, the Center for Environmental Farming Systems, which is why we call it SEFS. Um, I do our farm to school work um, and I also participate in our farm to early care education program and I'm also on what we call CORE which is our committee on racial equity and this is um, the kind of organizational team that we have that both does the racial equity trainings in the food system that we um, um, that we do with our partners, um, both programmatic partners and organizational partners, but then also um, kind of like just drives the organizational um, work that we do within our own entity as well. So um, <clears throat> the this screen is kind of our introductory core screen. And can you all see the whole screen? Or are you looking at this little thing and I need to get rid of it? Chelsea, can you tell me that? Um, we can just see the, I think we can see the whole slide. Okay, 
You're not looking at my awesome. participant screen thing? Nope. Great. Awesome. See how professional I am. Um, anyway, uh, so the the basic tenets, um, for instance, when we do a training, but also again how we kind of approach thinking through this work is this these basic ideas of needing a shared language. Um, that, and I'll talk more about language, um, needing a shared analysis um, that's based on a shared history, um, and then and then actual concrete tools um, for how to do the work. Um, I think theoretically understanding um, how structural racism in our food system and in our society work is big um, and can be overwhelming, um, but the um, um, the tools for how to walk it out day in day out are a big part of what I think is most important in this um, just because um, I, I think folks it can be um, to, to just look at the theory the history um, the impacts um, can be just re-traumatizing for folks of color who experience it day in day out already um, can be immobilizing for um, folks who um, are white and, and don't experience as much of it, um, I think structural racism impacts all of us. Um, and um, I could go on and on about that, um, and I probably will for the next hour and a half. Um, and then again, um, process and praxis, um, praxis um, you know, what are those infrastructure pieces that help us implement those tools that help us continually refine, continually learn to have a, a community group um, around using those tools day in, day out um, as we do our work, so. Mm -hmm. um, we do shared agreements, and I know that may seem really weird on a webinar, um, and again, um, it, um, especially if it is a big webinar, um, but I talk about these every time we talk about this work because I think some of the stuff that that I see really um, impacting me is that um, uh, we, we come to the table with folks that we work with regularly um, and we all too often work on assumptions, um, assumptions that aren't real um, and assumptions that are really dangerous um, and impact again how we um, communicate together, how we do our work together and the dynamics therein. Um, so, um, so we see going through shared agreements at the beginning of a meeting um, as an actual praxis um, that that lays out um, a racial equity framework from the get-go um, by naming these things by doing it together by identifying how we're going to function together um, we're putting a commitment on the table to work collectively with a collective approach um, and I know that that can seem really simple and again they're spaces and places um, where I'm working with folks who really find this annoying. Um, other folks are really gratified that we bother. Um, and, I, and again, this is part of um, the different cultures that we work in. Um, our food system work um, comes from so many different institutions, right? Um, and from um, grassroots activism um, and um, farmers to, you know, political agencies and, um, and not everybody's, um, I'm, I'm labeled in our group as the touchy-feely one. Um, it's now been um, promoted to um, emotional intelligence, um, so I'm getting some credit these days that I didn't used to, you know, maybe 10 years ago. Um, but again, you know, just, um, just the simple acknowledgement of how complicated this work can be in terms of um, what we personally bring to the table um, and, and the dynamic that that creates, creates in that. So, um, I don't know um, if there's, um, we've got a tool um, that we use um, that has all of these on the front and on the back side of it, um, some uh, racial equity practices that, um, that I'll share um, in a minute um, is on the back side of the tool. So it's a physical handout that we use, um, but I'm also, the website here, um, dismantlingracism.org, um, their um, DR Works is an organization that a lot of our materials came from. They were consultants for us in North Carolina on how to 
um, move our organization forward and how to work with our partners when we started doing um, racial equity in the food system at large. Um, and they have dismantled, unfortunately, um, as an organization. Um, but the upside of that is that they made all of their resource materials free and available on the website. Um, and it is really rich um, with stuff. It is not food system specific. Um, uh, we can talk about some resources that are, um, but for getting the kind of grounding work, um, their tools are amazing, and I um, really encourage you to check out that website. I'll refer to it a couple different times. Um, some of the things here, um, I'll name that, again, um, I'm hoping that folks will chime in with thoughts and discussion, um, but to think about is, um, I am is one of my favorite, um, how often in our language, so I'm even doing it now, um, will say we are or you know or um, when you go to the store and you buy this and and you find the prices are you know really reasonable or whatever and somebody else goes to the store and they don't find the prices so reasonable just that language and to shift that kind of thing to I am when I go to the store and I find this and I experience this um, that puts myself on the table and gives an opportunity um, for you to connect with me and me to connect with you not for me to subsume your experience right so um, thinking through all of these um, when we're in a training, um, again, another thing that we really believe in is like getting people talking. Um, and, um, and so, you know, we walk through these together, but we also put folks in pairs often um, and ask them to talk about what's difficult and what's easy about some of these. Um, a lot of these um, agreements are very similar to some of the racial equity practices that um, principles that I'll talk about later and a lot of them directly address some of the questions that y'all raised so for example um, nothing about us without us is for us um, um, over and over again folks are talking about you know who's making decisions how they bring partners to the table where and how um, people are working collaboratively to make things happen and again so um, thinking through um, how we do our work um, can start at this very simple basis of how we talk to each other across the table. Any questions about that? Does that seem really bizarre to talk about agreements? Y'all good? See, this is not a, hey, I don't see the little hands. Okay, all right. Um, I'm, I'm trusting Chelsea will, um, will holler at me if somebody's got something to, to chime in. Um, and I'm coming at this, you know, this webinar and talking to you folks, um, again, one, I really love talking about this. So um, I, I love hearing where folks are. And again, um, it was such an honor to be able to read through the way that you think through these questions that, that we posed and really appreciate that information. Um, the, um, you know, over the years that we've been doing this, um, we were, we were very entrenched, um, in the beginning and needing to talk about structural racism and institutions and the impact, um, at that institutional level. Um, and I still believe in that. I think that that's the most complicated element of this. Um, but, but, um, we were kind of dismissive of the personal aspect of it because um, we thought, well, the media does that all the time. The media scapegoats individual experience. They scapegoat those, those people. Um, they, um, you know, put structural racism off on um, neo-Nazis and the KKK. And um, again, you know, just really um, dump um, the impact of structural racism on the individual level, which um, allows us to skip the work that we really need to do to actually change things. Um, so we didn't deal with the personal stuff and we've come kind of back round. Um, I think it's a both and, and both and is one of my biggest racial equity principles in my life. Um, uh, just really thinking about um, what it takes individually to do this work day in, day out, um, to face life in the society, um, the way that our um, our systems work and impact us um, requires um, an emotional strength and resilience that is immeasurable. And um, I think it's connected to the amount of um, trauma and ill health and, and stress that we see in our society. And, and everybody um, has likely read the studies um, now, naming that racism causes stress. Isn't that great that we have a study to prove it now? 
um, um, and that that impacts our health and wellness um, and well-being. Um, but just really thinking through the emotional intelligence level, um, I'm just putting up names here because I'm thinking about from our space. You know, I've got um, um, resources here in this area that have been really powerful in this area. Um, so Campivia is a um, a Lumbee, a Native American woman who um, has done some training work with us recently, um, who um, focuses on this emotional intelligence. And one of the things that she says um, that I really love is um, that this work um, progresses at the rate of relationship. Um, and again, remembering that um, people are at the heart of this. Um, well, Kese um, Matsumoyo is out of Georgia um, and, and does some really amazing work on what he calls emotional. Um, um, what he calls emotional um, authenticity. Um, can somebody mute? Um, I'm just getting some feedback on the thing. Unless you've got a question, and that'd be great too. No questions? Okay. Um, um, what Kese um, calls it motion, uh, emotional um, authenticity, and he makes that distinction between intelligence and authenticity as intelligence being the knowledge around how our emotions work in this, um, in this uh, environment and authenticity being um, claiming the truth of how those emotions work and that being itself transformational and um, and revolutionary. And I love that. Um, I think, um, you know, again, the, the big idea is how and where we acknowledge those emotions and we use them to do the work um, instead of letting them get in the way. Um, the challenges on this personal front are um, uh, listed here, just kind of some basic implicit bias, um, which um, the Kerwin Institute is an amazing resource if you haven't done that yet. Um, it it um, has um, bias tests online that are available not only in race but um, in other areas. Um, we do our work in racial equity because we work in agriculture and education um, and um, those systems are so rooted um, in racism and um, and the kind of perpetuation of um, of white culture, white supremacist culture um, that we think we can't not do this. We can't we can't do um, food system work without doing anti-racist work. It's just not possible. Um, and we also believe that if you do the, um, the work around racism that we need to do, it also teaches us how to unpack any other bias in a way that's not true in reverse. So I can't work on sexism and get the same lessons learned and impact on how to do anti-racism work. Um, but if I do that work on racism, it will help me understand and how to unpack any other bias or ism, yeah? Um, confirmation bias um, is probably familiar to folks. Um, again, more and more our society, there's a lot on social media around confirmation bias. I think in the food system, um, we see that a lot too, that um, we're just working with people who um, um, see things the same way we do and so we're replicating the same kind of um, conditions and um, vision the same kind of patterns etc um, the opportunity is huge in food systems because so many different systems are involved so many different people because we can't do this work other than collaboratively um, the potential is so great to work with people who think nothing like I do. And I am so excited to do that, right? Um, it's really, really powerful. Um, so the opportunity is there as well as the challenge. And then just the cognitive dissonance, um, you know, that, um, that we see and believe this um, over and over again. Um, and then how we walk out our work is something totally different. And um, I think I mentioned this later, but there were two questions on the um, on the survey that were back to back, and one of them was um, how much are you doing this work, basically, um, and the other was um, how important is it that you're doing this work, right? Um, and um, and the numbers were equal. Um, I think this is in an, a later slide, but. Um, literally the number of people who said very important um, and um, we're not doing it at all were equal. 
And again, that's a great um, example of, you know, where we are in our society with the cognitive dis dissonance of race. Our um, society was built on racism. Um, it operates by racism, and it's one of the things we are least willing to talk about and to work on and to shift, right? Um, um, yeah, so again, the personal aspect. Um, a lot of the answers to the survey um, talked about fear, talked about the fear of saying the wrong thing, doing the wrong thing, um, not talking to the right person, um, talking to the wrong person, um, how you do that, et cetera. Um, and um, there is risk. There is risk because um, we are so embedded in it. So um, some of the tools for this personal thing is, um, um, is Oops Ouch familiar to anybody? It says Oops Couch, which is really funny, but um, not what I meant. Um, Oops Ouch, yeah. Um, uh, Oops Ouch is an easy tool. Um, if, if everybody is in agreement, again, it could be something you add to your agreements, that when you're having a meeting and talking, um, um, and, and probably that could be great if you could like send me little oops, ouch buttons, like that would float across the screen as I'm talking. Um, you know, I'll say things, um, really frequently that sound idiotic to someone, um, to, or to myself. Um, but you know, the ability for, um, the people I'm talking to, to go, ouch, that was a rough moment for me. Um, and whether they want to, not talk about it or talk about it later or talk about it right in the moment, right? That's a whole nother level of, of practice of like, how are we going to undo this? Um, but to be able to say for me to go, oops, when I know that I've said something um, that I um, now regret um, or somebody to hear something and, and rea react with ouch. Um, coming up with, again, those kind of relationship tools is, is the key to um, to dealing with emotional intelligence in the communities that you're working in and making those relationships stronger and stronger. Um, breath, um, again, um, we've got the whole, um, you know, movement in, um, in our country um, with the death of young black men um, and, and I can't breathe, right? Um, but breath literally will physiologically move you from a sympathetic nervous system to a parasympathetic ner nervous system. It can control how your body is reacting to stress. Um, and so to literally remember to breathe, um, especially those of us who have the privilege to pause and breathe, right? Um, and storytelling and listening. Again, this is about us. Um, and um, even things like... Um, um, again, this is on a, a later slide, but even things like being able to identify um, your racial identity um, in your own words, as opposed to checking a box, um, really thinking about the power of that to name yourself um, and to be heard um, in a different way. So, um, any questions about emotional intelligence? Kind of the grounding of um, of being able to do this work is acknowledging that personal aspect. Okay, language. Not surprising, a lot of people um, talked about definitions, um, and we asked you how you define racial equity. We didn't ask you about how you define structural racism. I'm going to talk a little bit about both of them again. Um, uh, here I mentioned um, just the power of being able to identify how you identify racially. Um, you know, it's something, again, we like push on um, registration forms or things like that. It's like um, some folks um, don't ever get the opportunity to name themselves in our society. And so where and how um, we like open up that box um, and really think through this. Um, all of this language, um, these definitions, the, the ones that we use come from critical race theory. It's not something we've dreamed up or even any of our many consultants. Um, it, it comes from a, an academic um, uh, work body that is based in the law. Um, and, um, and so we go through language so that we're all on the same page. Again, it's like the setting of agreements, um, so that we know what we're talking about, um, together, even if we have difference of opinions of how we really want to define that, 
um, that phrase or that word. In this moment, this is what we're talking about. And then we're all on the same page um, and we can have better discussions. So somebody mentioned um, these boxes and I love them. Um, probably a lot of folks have seen them and there are also many variations that kind of went viral and um, and folks have created innumerable kind of versions. There's one with folks grabbing apples out of trees that I really love for food system stuff. And um, and they're also really problematic in multiple ways. We could dissect these for a long time, um, but I think it kind of gets across um, some of the problems um, um, that we face in in just trying to talk about what we're what we mean. Um, the first two boxes, equality and equity, are the are the two that are used most often to kind of explain what we mean by equity in the first place. Um, um, I, I'm in cooperative extension. Um, you know, early on, uh, you know, I would hear frequently from agents, but we we provide the same resources to everybody, right? Um, and that, um, and, and then again, where that doesn't acknowledge that. Um, that the same doesn't necessarily meet the needs of everybody, right? Um, so in a society where um, things are not equal, um, providing the same resources doesn't get to people's needs. And that's the difference in the equity. Like um, it's literally illustrating that the needs of people, when the goal is to see over the fence here, right? Um, um, what folks need to see, um, to see the game, or what folks need to achieve health and wellness, what folks need to um, access their nutritional needs, et cetera, like meeting those needs, um, and some folks need more than others, um, et cetera. Um, what I love about the reality box, which you don't see quite as often, is what it acknowledges is, again, like the playing field that we're starting with, right? Um, and so, um, <clears throat> Um, the justice and liberation are um, a whole nother layer of things. And I, and I like this because when we talk about racial equity, um, some of these words like sustainability or organic, right? Like, you know, it's just the nature of our world. Um, and, for, and particularly we're familiar in, in our field with, you know, how terms get um, kind of co-opted and watered down a little bit. Um, and um, um, so, when we talk about racial equity, what we're talking about is when the um, opportunities and access um, that people um, have um, and the outcomes that people have, right, the outcomes being a, a particularly important one, um, are not dependent on their race or their zip code, right? And you've seen the studies more than likely about um, your zip code dictating your life experience expectancy, right, um, and how tied in zip code is to equity, um, I mean, to race. Um, so um, the, the justice image um, is like removing the need for the boxes, which I find really charming in some way. Um, one of my friends um, in a Facebook discussion was like, why are they never playing the game? You know, there's a whole nother thing, right? Again, we could dissect these for a long time. Um, liberation I like because the fence is actually gone. It's not only see-through, <laughs> but it's not there, right? So again, like thinking through what our actual goals are um, and how we're talking about what these mean. But um, when we're talking about equity, um, we're not talking about equality. We're not talking about sameness. We're talking about the ability to reach those outcomes and those goals. Yeah. Um, any question on this? I'm going to ask you some questions in a minute, but y'all aren't reading your email. While I'm talking on you. Just checking. Um, racism, um, so structural racism and racism as a definition. I think the main thing um, here is the inclusion of power. Um, um, I, the definitions that, that people shared around racial equity and what the, the kind of aspirational goals um, that um, as a way of how they saw racial equity were really powerful and beautiful. And, and just thinking in the flip of um, structural racism, making sure that we're not just talking about racial prejudice, but we're also talking about social and institutional power and both of those things. And we call this a recipe because we're really talking about the combination of all these things, um, giving us the definition. 
um, a white supremacy system. Um, white supremacy is a phrase that um, people don't like to say out loud, um, but it's real. Um, and again, there are lots and lots of trainings that can really go into this kind of thing of like, you know, what we mean by white supremacy. Um, and um, again, people think that we mean the KKK and neo-Nazis and um, it's so much bigger than that. Um, and you know, if you think about, like, I do farm to school and farm to ECE, and you think about um, the majority of um, expulsions and, um, uh, I can't think of the other one, um, but um, disciplinary actions um, that, that remove kids from schools, um, there are more that happen in pre-K than K through 12 combined, right? Pre-K. So what do you have to do to get kicked out of pre-K? Right. Um, and um, and you won't be surprised that um, the numbers for um, black children, particularly black boys, is multiple times that of of white children. Right. Um, and um, and I guarantee you that um, if I ask the majority of you, um, preschool teachers is not who we would name as the folks that were likely marching in Charlottesville, Virginia. Right? Um, white supremacy is a system um, that, that we all function under. It's the culture that we live in. It's the water that we swim in. It's the air that we breathe. Um, it is not about individual actors. You don't have to have racist individual actors to continue racism, right? Structural racism would still exist if we got rid of all of the people who overtly identified as racist. Right? If they just like went off to their own island, we would still have structural racism and we would still have white supremacy here. Um, and again, um, we really think that trainings are important to kind of like um, work on this information and process it. Again, particularly I speak as a white woman, um, you, you know, how long it takes to get this when um, the system itself is built to be invisible. And so I, like things are structured so that I don't see the things that I don't need to see, right? That's what keeps it in place. Um, um, we talk a lot about a system of oppression based on race when we talk about racism, um, but what I don't think we talk enough about is a system of advantage. Um, and white privilege is talked about a lot in our society, um, and I think it's also important to really recognize that um, you can live as a white person in America, um, you can live a non-privileged life um, but have a lot of advantages in our society, right? Um, and so thinking through um, those kinds of um, questions. Hey, Kim. Um, okay, Kim said that that was a good explanation of something, but I don't know what. So, yay. Um, um, and Sarah says, um, um, she never thought of white supremacy as being built to be invisible. I really, um, that's really awesome. Um, the, um, how many white people um, choose to do um, anti-racist work versus have to, right? Um, think about, um, you know, again, like, especially growing up as a, um, a young white person in the South, like, I heard a lot of, like, I don't do politics, I don't want to do that. Um, from white friends who like didn't have to do anything else, right? Um, when um, you have the option to think about oppression or not, um, to think about advantage or not, that's an advantage. Um, and, um, and again, like it, it's structured to be that way so that, um, so that it will perpetuate. And so that invisibility is a huge piece of it. Um, and something that trainings, education, self-education um, is um, listening, <laughs> um, paying attention, um, is are really tools for combating, right? Um, think about the way our history classes are structured um, for kids um, in our country and like what's told and what's not told, right? The, um, the, um, history is is um, is told by the what's it called? The phrase is like history is told by the um, the folks who won. Um, I don't know, but right, like they're whole stories that we don't tell and we don't hear, and we have to learn they're out there. 
Um, things like um, the people's history are great resources for kind of unpacking things that um, um, aren't aren't obvious if if it's not your lived experience, right? Um, and that was another theme that came up um, is um, you know that if you live in a predominantly white community um, or predominantly white um, um, area. Um, you know, how do you do this work or why, why would you need to do this work? And again, I, we come from a space where um, food system work, right, is like you can't get away from structural racism and food system work. And honestly, like when we do our trainings, um, we break down, we use a tool that I'll show you in a minute um, to kind of um, explain the three expressions of, of racism. Um, but then we use that to like go through and name the the institutions that are impacted historically and in present by structural racism, right? I, I'm hoping you all agree with me that education and agriculture are, you know, solidly there. Um, and then you start to name like what are the other institutions that are impacted by structural racism? And well, you know, the political system, the judicial system, um, the banking system, um, the religious system, the, and you start naming them and then try and come up with an institution that's not, right? And um, um, history is told by the victors. Thank you. Ah, I love the chat box. Okay. Um, so I'm going to move on to why. Um, I'm trying to check my time. Um, I'm trying to move on to why, um, and again, like um, thinking through a number of the answers to the questions. There was some beautiful stuff here. Um, I would love to sit down and chat with so many of you um, and hope that there's a mechanism in these peer-to-peer -peer webinars that allows for um, folks to talk to each other um, in follow-up of, of these topics that are raised and, and so forth. And again, um, um, maybe we can open things up in a minute. but. Um, so, um, I, we talk about like why we do this work on a personal level, um, and why we do it on an organizational level. So I think I've already touched on, you know, why on an organizational level we think addressing, um, structural racism is important. But, you know, for me personally, like just to be able to name these things and, and there was a really beautiful kind of interplay, um, in, the answers that you gave between the the personal kind of reaction and the organizational. So, um, the um, Lilla Watson quote, um, I think that um, most people have heard, um, you know, if you've come here to help me, no thanks, um, but if you've come up because your liberation is wrapped up with mine, right? And recognizing that um, that this impacts us all and that um, shifting the systems and the structures will benefit us all is something um, that's, that's really powerful to me because, um, uh, uh, yeah, uh, I'm not going to go there. Um, Latinx, um, somebody gave a really beautiful um, kind of like, again, numbers, like the numbers, like why do I do this? I do this because 80% of ag labor um, is Latino. 17% of the population is, and 2% are owner operators of farms, right? Like that's the kind of disparity that we see over and over and over again that cannot be explained by anything other, right? Um, there's a lot of um, pushback around um, socioeconomics and um, that a lot of this boils down to class, but the studies are endless that show that the disparities can't be explained away when you account for class. So if you disaggregate the data by race, and then you also compare and disaggregate according to class systems, um, <clears throat> um, there's a, still a disparity that's not explainable, right? So for example, um, if you look at um, uh, education, if you look at men who um, are white um, and have um, federal charges against them, they are still more likely to get hired for a job than black men who have advanced degrees and no ch criminal charges whatsoever, right? Um, and, it, you know, so, um, and this also gets into access, which maybe I'll talk in a, um, a little bit, um, but access came up over and over again and why 
um, that, that folks wanted to make sure that everybody has access to healthy, fresh food, um, that um, farmers had access to um, a viable living, um, and access is powerful and beautiful. And again, in a society where again and again we see people not having access, um, I, I understand why it comes up. And at the same time, if we live in a society where um, structural racism exists and our systems um, are racist, giving folks access to racist systems doesn't necessarily change their outcomes. Right. So another educational um, example for that is we've increased the access to education across the board. Right. Um, but the studies are beginning to show that black families um, have less um, 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 inherent value um, in their economics um, than before, because they're spending more on education to get degrees. And then again, who gets the job? Um, they are less likely to get the job. So they're higher, they have more access to education, they're getting more degrees, but they're higher in debt um, and lower still in income. Does that make sense? It wasn't the best explanation data um, points that aren't in front of me aren't my specialty. Um, um, yeah, USDA discrimination is a great um, example of, um, again, a system if we, um, um, if we open up opportunities to farmers um, and they still don't have um, um, uh, access to um, opportunities and other elements, then um, the loans won't necessarily shift anything. Um, if um, they can't um, access the markets, if they're not hired, if um, their air laws principles. So again, how all these systems work together. Um, and again, thinking back through the history, which I think was the point of the comment of um, that, um, and it's a good why, um, USDA, um, you know, when Bill Sack came out and really um, straight up acknowledged the structural racism that had been inherent in the USDA from its inception, again, like what does it take to actually shift that? We have for a while in the USDA, um, the system to address that and put it up and it just kind of slips away again, right? Um, and not to be negative, like again, another part of the why um, that's here is the potential and I really believe in this and um, so again, I work in farm to school and this is somebody else's quote. Um, I would love um, to know whose it was because I love to use it over and over again in my world. Um, but um, again, these institutions not only being severely limited and, um, and integrated so that they impact each other, um, which most systems do, um, but also cornerstones of upholding a white dominant culture, right? Structural racism and white supremacy. Um, but they also have the potential to like really shift things so that um, we can impact on a direct level. So direct impact, direct services, um, changing the lives of of kids that are right in front of you and changing systems. Um, and I think that that is kind of the key um, for me is how can we really change something um, in a way that all long time shift. Um, does anybody wanna um, like chime in and say why you do this work um, to add to, to what I was addressing? So we'll shift and talk about how and that's the big thing, right? How we do it day in, day out. I'm good if you don't. I know. Y'all are sitting there drinking your tea, having a lovely time. Kick back. This is peer to peer conversation. Um, I feel that, yeah, the moral imperative. Um, um, Right, I, again, that quote everybody knows is um, um, MLK's white moderate, like um, that, that the not doing of the, the not addressing it, um, the sitting back, the, um, the letting it happen when you know um, is, is the most evil, right? And, um, and I said evil and I, you know, 
I think that may be accurate. Um, that's, um, that's a lot, but yeah. Thanks, Sarah. Um, if you think again, like uh, perspective, and this is why um, multiracial groups are really important um, in talking through this. Um, and we do a lot of caucusing, which is like um, um, white folks together and um, and people of color together to talk through that things as you're coming from it in such a particular space. Um, and again, the the DR work. Um, workbook that um, is on this uh, website here and again is at the end to um, um, really walks through a lot of this stuff I think it's a great resource I, again I would recommend it but you know I think that work um, because of how you come to the work differently is really um, important um, but um, but doing this together I think is really vital and and again as a white woman recognizing how often my white counterparts are choosing or not choosing to do this work um, versus um, my um, counterparts who are people of color who don't have that option. You know, they can't avoid it if they want to. Um, and so um, what does it say for our society if we choose not to? Um, um, so um, questions and the how, and this was big and there were so many themes. Um, I, and I think that this was really, um, uh, Again, I think I have maybe 85 answers um, to look through. And um, again, there were big clusters um, of work and not necessarily like all threaded together. There were, you know, big disparities in how folks were looking at things, um, but there were still clusters. So nobody's alone. Yay. Um, no matter how you're looking at this, you are not alone. Um, but um, we asked about leaders doing this work and who you know in your community. Um, and I think that that's the biggest thing is um, particularly because food systems is multi-institutional and requires so much collaborative work it's a great opportunity to connect with those folks who are doing this work even if they they wouldn't identify with food systems or farm to school or um, distribution or supply chains or you know whatever it is um, if they're doing this work um, they will understand how food and health and um, and these things have a role in this and so connecting with that work that's already going on and acknowledging that is a huge um, a huge place to start a really successful place to start um, and um, Collective impact framework and practice um, again. There was a lot of um, I think um, we're subject to a lot of non-industrial um, or um, nonprofit industrial complex kind of syndrome. Um, everybody heard that phrase? Any thumbs up? Yeah, Chelsea's nodding anyway. Um, thanks, Chelsea. So. Um, but um, that, um, you know, that, that there's a problem and we'll solve it. And, um, and especially with organizations that are white led, white dominant, um, someone even wrote in that, you know, they had trouble getting grants because they were a P, um, POC, they were a people of color led organization. And the legitimacy that inherently comes with being white, right, in that white supremacist culture is, um, it, it is insidious um, and it's everywhere. But so you see over and over again, those organizations being seen as legitimate and organized, th those organizations having the capacity to write the grants in the first place. And then there's this, like, you know, the, you know, fixing the problem, right? Um, and inviting people who are impacted by the work to the table after you've already defined what the problem is, how you're going to solve it, you've gotten the money and you have some to dole out, and then you're like, oh, come to the table and help us work on this. Um, and the difference that happens when you're actually working together um, from the beginning, um, from the get go, um, with the, um, from all of those different spaces, right? Um, again, um, uh, Ms. Pevia says um, that this work works at the speed of relations. So thinking about relationships and trust, um, leaning into discomfort, um, there was a lot about that, you know, I'll say the wrong thing or I'm afraid I don't know, etc. And um, yep, <laughs> I don't know, I'm afraid, <laughs> I mess up. Um, and, and, and doing, um, putting racial equity um, and structural racism at the front of acknowledgement in our work 
um, and talking about it all the time means that I say the wrong thing that much more often. It's true, you know, um, and, um, and to me, that's better than the alternative, right? Um, so um, the, the how of the hugeness of starting, there was a lot of talk about agencies. Um, I don't know, is there any way, if you're, like, can you see the little thumbs up if folks do it, Chelsea? No, um, I need thumbs ups. If, um, do you know what I'm talking about? There's a little place that you can go um, on the chat box, I think. Um, um, if you go to your chat box, um, there should be a place where you can do a thumbs up. Is that there? Someone wrote in, click on the three dots. The three dots. <laughs> and the more. On the participant box. Yeah, I don't see it. This is going to take too much time, isn't it? Well, how about just yes, no? Um, if you are um, from um, a state agency of some sort, um, can you type in the chat box um, a yes or if you know how to do your thumbs up, you can teach us how to do that and figure that out. Oh, I see. It's on the participant list. Oh, I see. So Kim is doing um, down because Kim is from a nonprofit. Um, L. Wicker has a thumbs up. Is that it? Does folks see what I'm talking about? If you go to the participant list, you can like, yes, look at all the thumbs. Okay. Um, down, down, down. Okay, not state agencies, mostly nonprofit. If you're a nonprofit, pick your thumb up. Hey, hi, Mia. Okay. Interesting. Okay, sweet. Um, so again, like in some ways, um, I feel like, um, and again, I would love to know what folks think, um, either by a chat box or if you want to unmute yourself and speak up. Um, um, in some ways, I think, uh, you know, I'm working from an agency, a state agency, land grant university, cooperative extension. Um, the way we operate within Extension is a lot like a nonprofit because we're all grant funded. Um, we have our own kind of entity. So in some ways, we have the best of both worlds and the worst of both worlds. Um, but, you know, everybody has um, in participant box. Yes. Um, if, um, you know, everybody has their challenges. And I think um, the, the thing about starting is recognizing the urgency of this. Um, the, the urgency of structural racism that bodies are on the on the line every day, right? Um, people are dying because of racism every day, um, and the slowness of changing entire systems. Um, as again, Ms. Pivia says, um, we've got hundreds of years to to get us where we are, and we're not going to get out of it tomorrow, right? Um, and holding those two things is back to the both ends, um, and I think that that is. Um, uh, uh, a thing I hold in my head all the time just for survival is both and. Um, leadership versus workers was another theme of like folks who said that um, they had um, the um, drive to do this um, and, um, and they had coworkers, but their leadership wasn't supportive of it. Um, and, and, and where and how do you deal with that? I'll tell you, Food Corps taught me a lot about that. We managed Food Corps in North Carolina for years, um, and eight years, and, um, and they talked a lot about managing up, and they were really good at it. Um, but, you know, I think to remember that all movements start from the mass of folks, right? Um, most movements start with students um, or workers, um, but um, I'm going to talk in a minute um, more explicitly about some of the principles that we use, and, and my favorite one deals with this. But um, uh, the the main the main thing I can say there is what's been successful for me is that we have worked where it was where there was impetus to do the work, not where there wasn't. Does that make sense? So um, if my leadership was not about it. Um, then I would work with the folks who I worked beside who were about it and figure out how to do it, you know, there um, until, uh, until things shifted. Um, again, I'll talk about that more in a minute. Yeah, somebody want to speak?
No, they're just unmuting again. Okay. All right. Um, and then can't be political. Again, I work for Cooperative Extension. Um, we're trying to do some um, partnership work in, in a, um, a coalition around uh, literal policy work, and we're always dancing around what we can do and what we can't do, um, and just trying to be steadfast. And we're doing this education um, that will facilitate um, the work that other partners can do. Um, so um, you hear that, like, can't be political, as in getting involved in politics. Um, but the way that that racism is defined as political, I think, is really fascinating in our society, right? So that um, uh, racism becomes partisan, as if racism only impacts um, liberals and not conservatives or, right, you know, that kind of dynamic um, and, and how we can reframe the concerns um, that we have around making our society um, work for all of us um, as a nonpartisan issue, right? It ought to be a nonpartisan issue. And um, some, of, some of the most amazing um, educational um, departments and programs in the government came out of Republican parties, you know, at certain times and moments. Like, um, uh, it, it's not a, a liberal versus conservative thing or Democrat versus Republican. Um, and, um, and it can be. Um, and people also want to define it as urban and rural. Um, and again, um, the, the biggest thing is to talk, um, not to not talk, right? Um, and we'll get into that in a minute. Um, the other thing was funding it was another big um, theme around question of how. Um, again, like um, the question of who gets the money I already um, spoke to, um, and that's very real, and I hear that all the time. And again, um, we, we have, we face that. You know, our organization is a gatekeeper. Um, we are out of the land-grant university, so we have um, that um, infrastructure behind us. Um, and um, and there's so many groups doing racial equity work, um, and how do we support um, all of those groups at the same time that we're trying to do this um, within our own institutions and um, and trying to address it from um, a cooperative extension. Uh, so uh, again, the other questions around funding that I thought were really interesting were. Um, when there's so much urgency um, around the need of, um, you know, be it hunger or nutrition or, um, you know, keeping your farm, um, et cetera, like, how do you add racism work, um, structural racism work or racial equity work? And again, I, I would argue that it's the process as much as the goal. It's how we do that work. Um, and it is additional. I won't lie. It's additional because it's slower because it requires talking to people and connecting with people um, and, um, and not just doing our work on our own. Um, and so there's that aspect of it. Um, hold on just a second. Hi, gotta go. Um, but um, somebody just came on, um, do you wanna add something? No? Somebody popped up their video. It's really fun to see a video. Nope. Okay, see how easily I lose my place? Um, <clears throat> and then the fear, um, again, the how over and over again about the foul. Sorry, that was my wife. I may end up with a baby here any second, too. So, again, it's been a real day. Um, that's just the way it is. Um, so, um, the one of the tools that um, that I have here um, and that is um, that you'll see in that workbook and on some of the other websites and resources that I lead you to is kind of this idea of phases of racial equity practice in your organization because again this was a theme it's like where do we start um, how do we do this work as an organization um, and um, so the workbook and DR work um, talks at length um, through each one of these different um, phases um, or stages um, and um, and the, the only challenge that I find in this like I think it's really comforting um, as a tool um, in some of them to, to think about okay so um, we're um, 
we're at this place where we've been studying this and working together. All our staff has gone to trainings. We have some language. We have some practices in place where we like do agreements and, um, and we have some explicit goals, which I'll talk about in a minute. Um, but like, whoa, is this thrown everything that we're doing into chaos and we're a little bit unclear, right? There's, there's a comfort in being able to define that. Um, and this tool will give some, some kind of guides out of that. Um, the thing that I would, um, encourage you if you go and, and look at this tool in detail um, is to remember that it's not necessarily linear. Um, nothing in this work is necessarily linear. So just because you've moved from familiar dysfunction to you've made an explicit commitment to like, oh, now what, who are we and what are we doing, doesn't mean you're not going to go back to familiar dysfunction, right? Um, and um, and just because you've got clearly um, defined equity goals doesn't mean you're not going to back up um, and get lost a little bit in, in what that commitment is. Um, the, um, the idea of, of this tool, um, there are lots of organizational assessment tools out there. Um, um, again, the number one thing that I would encourage you to do is find organizations that are already doing the work. Um, if you can find a partner organization that's similar to you, um, you may be able to kind of um, work through things together. Um, our organization um, hired a couple of different consulting organizations who did um, racial equity work, um, trainings and consulting um, to help us look at our organization. Um, they also eventually helped us train us um, by doing training side by side with us so that we could do um, trainings with our partners um, because we couldn't afford to keep hiring them over and over again and they were just really amazing um, but um, you know again you've got to have resources to do that um, but one of the things that we did at, a, at, at the very beginning um, is create um, so we we did these racial equity trainings with our staff um, then we did them with our partner organizations that we did a lot of collaborative work with so again, we have these tools um, for, of language and history and analysis that we could all be on the same page and work together. Um, but those trainings are just the delivery of those tools. And that's what's really important to remember. Um, and so what we started was these monthly gatherings where they were basically like study groups. We would have um, a piece of something that we looked at, whether it was an article around food systems um, and racial equity or a a chapter or a poem or a video, like a really wide ranging um, materials that we use as the conversation starters. Um, but then we met for two hours and talked about it and how it um, showed, how the issues raised in that piece showed up in our day to day work and what we did about it. Um, and um, this has been cross organizational, it's cross um, hierarchy, so you know, everybody and, and all participate, it's interracial. Um, and it's been really, really powerful, and we've been doing it for over four years now, um, every month, <laughs> you know. Um, but again, that's like a way that we came up with to address our practice. Um, so getting the support that you need, finding the resources, um, and also coming up with like, what is this going to look like um, day in, day out in terms of, of walking or talk? Um, the other tool that I want to share um, is these principles of action. And I, I mentioned we have this little accordion that we hand out that has the agreements on one side and the principles of action on the other. And they really um, overlap with each other over and over. Um, and I'm going to walk through some of these because they address so many of the questions um, that were raised um, in your survey. Um, it's five after five. Um, I can fill up the rest of this time, but I want to pause one more time just to see if anybody has any questions or things that they want to bring up now, um, just um, as general talk so that you're not all listening to me. Because I can't believe you want to listen to me for an hour and a half in what's called a peer-to-peer -peer webinar. I do, do have one question, let me. Great. Ah, I don't know if that worked. Um, 
I'm Mia, and I am in an organization that within my department, we, um, both my manager and my director um, are black, and, but within the organization as a whole, the higher up is white led. And we are seeing a change in the organization since our new leadership has come on where it's becoming more white, both in being who is hired and in the culture shift. Um, and I have a very small department, so we're 50% um, people of color because our department's four people. Um, and it's, it's great, it's a great working environment, but in terms of leveraging that influence to the rest of the organization, um, we just are very limited. Um, and we're also doing emergency food relief which means that we are not positioned to address systemic issues of hunger and food systems as well. So my question um, and motivation for in engaging is really how to make the most um, out of the position that I occupy within my nonprofit. Wow, it's almost like I asked you to, to do that, to set me up to talk about this um, organizing mind, this first principle. Um, that's tough. Um, that's really tough. And, um, and I feel like um, not an uncommon story. Um, and, um, you know, I, I wish I had like, oh, all you do is X, Y, and Z and you'll fix that. Um, but, um, <laughs> but this first principle, again, is my favorite. I alluded to it earlier, and it comes from Viktor Frankl, um, who was a Holocaust survivor, um, and, um, and, and Stephen Covey picked it up from him um, in the, I, I can't ever remember, what is it? Chelsea knows. Um, the highly successful people, something. Anyway, um, but, but the idea is, um, and it's, it's an organizing principle, right? Community organizing. Um, that, um, that you start with those folks, um, that are already there and, um, that are already with you and you work with them. And, you know, so people will talk about preaching to the choir and like, yeah, make that choir good, you know, like, um, so your department needs to be talking about this stuff together and strategizing together if they're all on board right I mean sometimes you're just surviving when you're in that environment right um, and um, but um, but but working with there and and you start with this nucleus of these people that are in your network um, that are already on board um, and 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 then you inch out so those people who are kind of interested in what you're doing in your department so is there a department that you overlap with um, or you know, are there individuals in other departments that that you can kind of like bring into that conversation, you know, um, and because then they have people in their department that maybe they could have that conversation with right um, until again, there's there's a mass that can actually move things. Um, it's um, it's not unrelated to a, a permaculture principle too. like uh, um, it, sometimes my gardening folks like you know that you don't plant a tree in the middle of the desert um, you plant it on the edge of the forest as far out as it'll survive um, but not where it's most needed but as far edge as it will survive and you can inch that margin out right so like how can you take the concerns and the um, and the um, the perspective and vision that you have in your department with your in integrated team um, to those other places and other spaces in the organization at large, right? Um, you know, because something like managing up and trying to get leadership to shift their thinking um, may just backfire. And again, what we know is when we push in ways that, um, um, that we're not ready um, for, the people who are most impacted are the people of color, right? Um, and so um, I, I had a white friend not long ago who lost her job because she was pushing for racism and she was absolutely shocked that she lost her job because she was fighting for racism. I'm like, you know, <laughs> like this happens to people all the time, right? Um, and, um, and again, we develop um, this, uh, we white people can develop this um, 
blanket of comfort, right? And so you also have to be careful where and how you push um, if you're not going to be the one impacted, right? Um, so start with those people who are with you. It probably doesn't help much, but I get it. The other thing is to look at models, um, especially in food security. Anybody else in food security? I'm going to pull up my little participant list and see if your little thumbs come up. Um, anybody else working in food security? Oh, there's some hands. There's some thumbs. There's a thumb. Sorry, Hannah. Um, but, you know, the other thing is to look at the models in the country of, of food security organizations that are doing things systemically as well as direct action, right? So, like, we've got an organization here in North Carolina that I, I really appreciate that um, over the last decade um, have really moved from just direct service of food relief to training programs and cooking um, where they place folks um, in restaurants as they as they move through the training program um, where they have um, uh, gardens um, and a farming program you know you know just kind of you're like smiling you get it you know who I'm talking about um, you might be with them I'm just kidding um, again nothing's linear it goes up and down um, does that make sense to folks organizing mind is one of my favorites like it's a go-to. And for years I had these things on my wall. Now that we have this nifty little printout and I can send that to you if you want it. Um, like, you know, it's now it's cute and neat. It used to be like splatters of paper. All of these are really fleshed out in that DR Works handbook. Um, does that help any at all, Maya? Mia? No. Yeah, no, it does. Um, I think the challenge for us has been that the impact then hits my director and then my manager who are already most at risk. Um, so yeah. we enjoy the work environment that we have, but, and I'm also very curious because it might be my organization that you're talking about. So there are things that are, are, are yeah. being done, but yeah. yeah. But that was great. I, I like to tell the best case scenarios of the organizations that I know. So we won't mention names. So. Yeah. Um, I'm going to skip from, um, explicit goals to honor the power on the margins because I think that that ties in kind of where this um, conversation is at the moment is um, and and this used to be build power on the margins just to illustrate that like you know um, at, even folks with their tools like you have to constantly learn and hone um, I spent um, this morning in a, a racial equity Institute lecture that was amazing has so much data um, um, and just really thinking about um, the constant honing of, of tools. Um, um, but honoring the power on the margins, again, like I, I think there's a tie-in with like thinking through who's already doing the work, because I go into communities and folks are like, oh, there's no racial equity work going on here. And I guarantee you there is racial equity work going on everywhere because it has existed um, throughout time and so there is resistance to it throughout time and you can find that right um, but honoring what's already happening but this also goes to like um, really honoring the lead of those folks who are most impacted right and so not pushing in an organization in a way that will um, that could um, impact people dangerously again livelihoods or lives right um, when that's not what they want, right? So what's the work that you can do in your own life, in your own spheres, in your own um, um, areas um, that, um, that will honor that? Um, it's a really big one. Um, um, there was a picture of a slide from another anti-racism. Yeah, there are a lot of them. Seven Habits of Highly Effective People. Thank you. Um, um, think and act collectively. I've already talked about. Um, again, when you bring folks to the table, where and how you're doing their work. I mean, food security is a great example of like, um, you know, the organizations that I've seen who like decide that um, a community market or a um, uh, a pop-up market or a farmer's market or a community garden in a certain um, housing community is a great idea and they decide that themselves without the input of those organizations and, and again like I know that this is um, familiar but you know it's patterns that we get into in our food system work that again um, pausing backing up um, and if we have other um, 
perspectives at the table, um, we can rethink the patterns that we um, have had in the past. Um, but again, it's about um, honoring the work that folks are already doing. Um, accountability to people and principles ties into that too. Again, it's another one of my favorites. Um, in the, you know, I think for years I was really accountable to principles. Like, you know, it's like I'm learning this stuff and I've got it and I'm figuring it out. And I miss um, the accountability to the people that were impacted by that. So, you know, the the organizational um, story that um, Mia shared is a great example. Like, you can be so dead set on introducing racial equity and whatever that that the people who are most impacted daily in their lives. Um, with, without any control over that, um, are impacted by your good intentions to do better work, right? Um, and so we have to act collectively. Um, and again, I'm speaking there as, um, from a white perspective, um, which tends to be how I speak. Do you know this? Um, know yourself, um, and I skipped explicit goals um, way back, um, but um, really naming um, what you're trying to do once you have um, some momentum in your organization um, and you can do it for yourself too like what I'm going to do is I'm going to educate myself and every day I'm going to read something for 30 minutes um, that relates to my work um, and racial equity um, you know like really small things you know uh, are a starting place um, um, taking care of yourself um, can be another explicit goal um, that can be um, you know, invaluable, um, the, the, um, the day in, the day in, out pressure. Um, um, uh, know yourself again, this relates back to the emotional intelligence stuff. Um, really doing that work so that you know how you're showing up, um, as well as knowing um, the kind of bigger picture. So it's not just knowing the data, knowing how racism shows up in food systems, knowing um, the numbers um, of um, disaggregated um, information to show disparities. That's all great and wonderful. It also talks, it also means to think about how you're showing up in any given situation um, so that you can be at, at your best um, to um, collectively do this work. And this is the, um, this is kind of a key to um, some of the analysis structures that we use. Um, and um, again, the basic idea here is that racism works on multiple levels and that we have to work on all those levels at the same time to actually make change. Um, so um, this is what I was talking about with the personal. Um, the institutional, I think, is something that we see, again, in our work because it's so, inter or in so institutionally um, uh, integrated, right? And that's the nature of institutional racism is that you know, how the banking system works with the food system, works with the agriculture system, which w works with the educational system, is so integrated that, that it like feeds on itself and um, things. Um, the cultural aspect, the big circle, um, is again this notion of like, it is everywhere all the time and it impacts us, right? Um, that um, from day one, before I even come out of the womb, um, I am, as a white woman, um, uh, impacted by advantages um, that um, that are not there for people of color. And so to ask these questions again and again um, of everything you do from um, the way you structure your programs to the way you're writing your grants to the way your hiring policies work is how have people of color um, excluded, underserved, exploited, oppressed, and how, um, again, um, just as important, how are we advantage, um, advantaging, can you see me moving these things around, is that annoying? Um, <clears throat> white people, um, how are they included, served, resources, validated, uplifted, et cetera, right? Um, this is another tool, again, that I think just to have up um, and to use again and again when you're um, doing pretty much anything um, can be really helpful. Um, these, um, these principles, um, and again, um, uh, there's a lot of detail, um, that, um, is laid out in the, in the resources that I'll lead you to, um, 
there are so many resources these days and so many articles, so many beautiful things. You know, like I, I've named here ours um, so that you can uh, feel free to go to those. But more, it's like the acknowledgement of these are these are our go-to resources. Um, but there are um, national resources that are phenomenal. The Racial Equity Institute has data, um, and it has compiled data from many other studies. Um, so uh, what they do is kind of aggregate multiple studies and come up with the data for disproportional um, evidence. Um, but there's so much. Um, and again, your local resources are, um, are human-based. Right? Um, who are the people that are doing this work um, and where and how can you connect um, with the stuff that they are doing? Um, and that will teach you how it will show up in your own work, but um, to support and, and drive that. Um, what, um, what questions are there? What um, thoughts, et cetera? There's still a lot of thumbs up and thumbs down. I don't even remember the last question I asked. Hi, Tess. Question. Hi, Anna. Hi, Anna. Um, how are you? Hi. Good. How are you? Thanks Good for this presentation. Your face. Always a, a, appreciate opportunities like this to continue learning, to continue knowing myself better. And and um, I think that's this, especially this resources slide is related to my question, which is I find myself, or I don't know if this is so much a question, or I'm just looking for like words of wisdom and feedback, but I find myself sometimes getting frustrated in my work with how much time I feel like I and my organization spend justifying why racial equity is a priority for us. Um, Isn't it ridiculous? Yeah. Yeah. And sometimes Sorry. it feels like a barrier to like moving forward and actually putting our justification into action because we're just, we're like still trying to bring people along, you know, like, um, and at what point, and, and so I'm finding myself at this point being like, there are resources out there. Like, I don't feel like we need to keep spending our time justifying if other people aren't going to get on board, then like, that's their, their problem, not ours. We need to keep moving forward. What can you say to me to help me? <laughs> yeah, no, I think that's great. And I wonder if other people have that question too. Um, I, I think for me, that's another both and. Right. Um, so it's twofold. One, I would go to, again, the principle of organizing mind and like you can get the most work done with the people who are already on board so that you're not spinning your wheels trying to convince people that racism exists, which, again, seems really ludicrous in this day and age. But we're also trying to convince certain people that climate change exists, you know, and if you're a farmer, like, you know that it exists. Right. Like, so it's a reality of our of our world. Um, and so that's the both and, um, is that um, on one level, I would say, um, yeah, figure out where, um, where, where your investment um, makes the most sense for your organizational goals, right? And then the other, and it may be like work with the people who are already there, right? And, and quit trying to convince other folks that, um, um, if that's distracting from your making movements forward and at the same time because there's always an and um is that like as a white woman um that resistance comes from white people right because i seriously doubt you're trying to convince any people of color that racism exists check Just yeah don't want to make any exactly. assumptions okay yeah, so as exactly. a white woman yeah i feel like um one of my biggest responsibilities is working with other white people and so I, I want to take on more of that kind of, sorry, BS, um, than, than somebody else, right? So um, for me, it's both, um, is that as an organization, maybe I want to shift towards working with folks who are already aligned with this work and are ready to do it with us right? And me as an individual or me as an organization to a certain percentage, I want to continue to produce the data, continue to push the limits, continue to, um, to name it where it's not being named, et cetera, right? And again, the only balance in there is that I'm doing that in a way that's not going to negatively impact people um, who are already negatively impacted by the inequities in our system. Does that make sense? Totally. Yeah. yeah. And I really appreciate that answer. And I think you're exactly right. It, it is a both and, and, um, 
and I feel that same sort of like every time I find myself feeling frustrated, I'm like, but I'm a white woman, woman. And like the people who are not coming on board are white people. And like, that's a role that I have to continue having conversation with them to do what I can to bring them on board. I think that's a burden that I can carry. Um, and that doesn't need to be a burden on people of color or, or other um, folks who aren't, don't have the same advantages and privileges that I do. So I appreciate that response and your encouragement. Yeah. Um, yeah, my, um, um, no, I'm not going to tell that story. It's a personal story, but anyway, yeah, there are times and places where, um, my wife is a person of color and there are times and places where like, um, you know, what she, um, what she faces are stuff that I need to pick up because (laughs) she doesn't have time for it. She's got priorities and, you know, and she faces stuff day in, day out, right? Day in, day out. Um, and, um, and so there are places where I can pick up, um, talking to those white people or, or shifting that or addressing that. Um, and she can keep doing what's important to her. Right. Um, yeah, again, other, other thoughts or questions. It's like 528. One more question or thought or comment or brilliant insight. Somebody posted the 20 day racial equity habit building challenge again. Um, yeah, I think stuff like that is really, you know, what works for you. Um, that it's, that's a really, um, concrete way to like put it in front of your face day in, day out. Right. Um, and I, I think that can be really useful again, particularly for white people. Um, yeah, there, there are lots of resources for white folks. The, um, the knapsack, unpacking the white knapsack. I can't remember the actual title, but that's enough to get you there. Um, um, is a great resource um, just for acknowledging your own stuff. Um, the I told you I went to the REI um, workshop today, and what I um, am was really inspired by and reminded there um, was um, how much data is out there um, and how much disaggregated data is out there. So if you're trying to convince people, know that that um, there's stuff to pull together to do that. It's, that's a job that we should do a better job of in the food system work, I think, but it's possible. Um, anybody wants to chat with me? Um, please do. Um, I, uh, my website, I mean, my website, my uh, email is here. I'm happy to talk with folks anytime. Um, uh, out of a number of the collaboratives we have, I have ongoing conversations around racial equity with other partners, um, and it, it just sustains me and helps me concretely in doing the work. Um, and so um, I would welcome um, any conversations that anybody wants to have. Thank you all. Thank you for so your thumbs up. for joining us, Tess, and, and leading that great discussion. Um, we will send out the recording of this webinar to y'all and um, along with a list of resources that Tess mentioned and that were shared in the chat. Have a great night and uh, we'll be in touch. Mm -hmm.